Hello, Curran here. This video is about making a bar chart with D3 and SVG and also all the nitty gritty details that go along with that. If you know the basics of D3 DOM manipulation and SVG and you want to learn about visualizing data using D3 data joins, scales, and axes, then this video is for you. We're going to cover these topics in this video. Representing a data table in JavaScript, uh, with CSV also. Creating rectangles on the screen for each row of our data table. Using D3 linear and band scales. The D3 margin convention. And adding axes. Let's start by representing a data table in JavaScript. I came across this awesome image, Earth at Night, by NASA, and it got me wondering what are the biggest countries in terms of their population? This data set from the United Nations contains the population of every country. I downloaded this Excel file and then isolated the top countries by population of 2018. Then I exported this as a CSV file and then did some hand tweaking to make the column names nice, country and population, and also removed the spaces from the numbers. CSV stands for Comma Separated Value. This is a very common text-based data interchange format. And it's also very convenient to load and parse using D3. The next thing I'm going to do is fork this D3 face example from a previous video by clicking on this fork button right here. I'll change this title here to making a bar chart. Next I'll go to index.js and delete most of this code that we had here for the face. And we don't need arc from D3 here. And I'll also clear out the old readme. All right, what we want to do next is get this CSV data into VizHub as a CSV file. To do this, I'm going to click on New File. I'll give it a name of data.csv. I'll create this new file here, data.csv. Then I'm just going to copy this text from my text editor into here. Now we can load in this file, data.csv, using JavaScript. Over in our index.js, we can import another utility from D3 called CSV. We can load data.csv by invoking CSV and passing in the path data.csv. This returns a promise that resolves when this data is loaded. So we can say dot then and pass in a callback that accepts data as the argument and then in the body of this function, just to check if this is working, we can say console.log data. And if we take a look in the console, we can see that indeed this array of 10 objects has been loaded. This CSV function of D3 makes an XML HTTP request for data.csv, which makes an HTTP request, loads that CSV string from data.csv, and then it also parses the CSV string into an array of objects, where the keys of each object represent the columns, and the values represent the values inside the table. And there's one object here for each row of our original table. One problem here, though, is that the population values are strings, but they really should be numbers. To do this, we can say data.foreach, a function that accepts d, one row, and it says d.population equals plus d.population. And that unary plus operator parses strings into numbers. Now if we take a look at what we've got, we can see that indeed the population values are numbers. Also, these population values are in thousands of people. So to get the actual population number, we can multiply this here by a thousand. Now these values here are the actual number of people for each country. 
All right, our data is loaded, parsed, and ready to be visualized. We've represented a data table in JavaScript. Now, let's create rectangles for each row of that data table. Instead of invoking console.lock, we can make a new function called render. And we can define that above, up here, say const render equals a function that takes as input the data and then in the body of this function is where we can add our code that will make one rectangle for each row of this data set. What we want to do here is append rectangles to our SVG element for each entry in this data array. And to do this, we can say svg.select all rect to begin with. This will make a D3 selection that contains all the existing rectangles on the page, and there are none for now, but that's important information for D3 to have when making a data join. And we can make a data join by saying dot data and pass in this data array. A D3 data join conceptually looks something like this. On the one hand, you've got your data, which is your array of objects from the CSV file. And on the other hand, you've got your DOM elements. And in our case, these will be rectangles. The D3 data join lets you deal with three separate cases, enter, update, and exit. The enter case is what we're about to deal with. And that is the case where there are more entries in the data array than there are DOM elements on the screen, or in, in the DOM already. See, that's why we need to say select all rect to get that set of elements, which initially is the empty set. There are no elements. That means that when we create the enter selection, we're going to create um, a thing that sort of pertains to all of our data elements. And we can use the enter selection to create one rectangle for each row of our table. All right, so in the code here, we've created our D3 data join, and then by using method chaining, we can say dot enter, and then on the enter selection, we can append a new rectangle. We're not seeing any rectangles here because we need to give them width and height. So we can say dot attr width is, let's say, 300, just so we can see something, and also the same for height. All right, we see one big rectangle on the screen, but if we inspect the DOM here, we can see that there's actually multiple rectangles here. It's just that they're all in the same place, so they're sort of overlapping with one another. But hey, we've successfully created one rectangle for each row of our data table. Next, we can use D3 linear and band scales to really make these rectangles bars of a bar chart that correspond to the data. First, let's construct a linear scale. We need to access uh, scale linear as a D3 function. So we can import that. And then let's say const x scale is an instance of scale linear. And we can invoke scale linear as a function to create an instance of the D3 linear scale. Conceptually, a linear scale looks something like this. You've got the domain, which goes from some beginning point to some ending point in terms of numbers. And you've got a range. And the linear scale maps values from the domain to the corresponding values in the range. I like to think of the domain as data space, because these are values that occur. It's sort of the space of values, the um, extent, the minimum and maximum values that occur in your data. I like to think of the range as screen space, because these are typically in uh, pixel coordinates. In our case, we want to compute the width of each bar in pixels. Linear scales are useful when you have quantitative attributes. Here's another nice diagram for linear scales that sort of expresses the notion that, you know, points in the domain sort of stretch across points in the range. For example, if the domain goes from 20 to 80 
and the range goes from 0 to 120, then a value of 20, if you pass it into the linear scale, will map onto a value of 0. And a value of 80 will map to a value of 120. And everything in between will be sort of stretched linearly. For example, if you give 40 as input, you'll get 80 as output. So that's the concept of a linear scale. With D3 linear scales, you can set the domain and range using method chaining like this. You can say dot domain and pass it an array that contains two elements. These elements represent the minimum and the maximum values for the domain. So if we want to use a zero baseline, which you really always should with bar charts, the first entry in this array should be zero. And the second entry in this array should be the maximum value for the attribute of the data set that we want to use to encode width of these bars. D3 has a really nice utility for computing the maximum, and we can import that as max from D3. We can use the max function by passing in the data array as the first argument, and passing in as the second argument a function that accepts one row of the data array as input, and it returns the value that we want to compute the max over. So if we take a look at data.csv, that's going to be d.population. So I'm just going to copy that and say, all right, this function will return d.population. That should compute the maximum. To check if this is working, we can say console dot log x scale dot domain and we can just invoke domain without any arguments and that will return the domain back to us. This is what we see in the console. It goes from 0 to this number which does appear to be the maximum population value, that of China. A range also accepts an array with two elements and since this deals with the width of the bars for a bar chart, this is going to start at 0 because a data value of 0 should map to a bar size of 0. And the maximum here should be width, which we extracted from our SVG element. This means that the maximum population value should map to the maximum width of a bar, which is the width of our SVG sort of container. And again, we can check this by saying console.log xscale.range and in the console we see it goes from 0 to 960, which is correct. To use this x scale to compute the width of our bars, and by the way, this is going to be a horizontal bar chart, instead of passing 300 here, we can pass a function that takes as input d, one row of our data table, and this can return the x scale of the value which we want from the domain, which is d.population. Now if we inspect the DOM, we can see that we have a bunch of rectangles that have different widths. Now we need a y scale that will separate the bars and determine their height. For this, we can import scale band from D3. Then we could say, all right, const y scale equals scale band and we're also going to want to set the domain and the range of the y scale. A band scale does a different kind of a mapping from domain to range. In this case, for example, we might have strings a, b, and c as part of our domain. These map onto a range that is sort of defined by the beginning points of these rectangles here. And again, we've got this sort of data space, our domain, and we've got screen space, the range. Band scales are useful for ordinal attributes. In our case, we want to set the domain to be all of the country values from the data. We can do that by using data.map to compute a function over all these elements of the data array, and this function can take as input d, one row, and return d.country. Now if we take a look at the 
y scale domain. Oh no, we've got some sort of error here. Y scale dot domain is not a function. Oh, that's because I didn't pass anything into the range, so it returned the default range and assigned that to y scale. So if I just comment out dot range here, okay, now we can see the correct domain. See, it's all the country values. All right, now we can set the range to go from, let's say, zero to height. This will cause the data elements to be arranged from top to bottom. Now we can use the Y scale to set the height of these rectangles by saying Y scale dot bandwidth. And we can access the bandwidth by calling bandwidth as a function. Bandwidth is the computed width of a single bar. We can also compute the Y attribute. We can say dot ATTR Y. And this will take as input D and it will return the y scale of d dot country. All right, check it out. We've got the essential essence of a bar chart, the bars, working. I think I'll get rid of this console.log. We don't need that anymore. Before we go any further, I'd like to eliminate this duplicated logic where we access d dot country here and also here, and we access d.population here and also here. This sort of style makes it difficult to change the data later on. Or let's say you wanted to visualize something other than population, you'd have to change it here and also down here. To solve this, we can introduce uh, what I like to call value accessors. So let's make uh, const x value equals this same function here. It just takes as input d and it returns d.population. And we can use x value here when we compute the max. We can also use x value here. So instead of saying d.population, we can say x value of d, which is effectively the same thing. And we can do the same thing for y. We can take this function that returns d.country and we can say const y value is that function right there. And then we can use y value in this data.map. And we can also use it in this section right here. So instead of d.country, we can say y value of d. All right, now our code here is not specific to any particular data set. And we've limited the specific stuff to these two lines right here. Now that we've got these bars, we need to sort of tell the viewer what they mean. Um, and for that, we can use axes. But first, before we add axes, we need a place to put the axes. We need some space along the left and also probably along the bottom. For this, we can use the D3 margin convention. The margin convention looks something like this. We can specify the left top right and bottom margins in terms of how many pixels away from the edge is this inner rectangle where we can put our bars. That will give us some space so we can put the axis, say, on the left or on the bottom. And our bars will still have uh, breathing room in here. The idea behind this is that we'll, we're going to have a group element for this inner rectangle. And that's going to be translated by margin.left and margin.top. Let's start by introducing const g, a group element. This will be svg.append g. Then we're going to append our rectangles to g rather than svg. We're going to want to set the attribute of transform to be, um, I'm going to use a string template literal here, translate by something in the x direction and something else in the y direction. And in the x direction, meaning pushing it to the right, this is going to be margin dot left. And then in the y direction, this is going to be margin dot top. But of course, this isn't going to work because we haven't defined margin. 
up here, let's say const margin equals an object with top as 20, right as 20, bottom as 20, and left as 20. 20 here is the number of pixels away from the edge that the inner rectangle is going to be. See how now the rectangles are away from the edge by 20 pixels. And if we increase the top to say 200 pixels, it goes down like this. And if we increase, say, the left to 200 pixels, it goes to the left by 200 pixels. But the problem is that the bars are going off the screen here. And this is because for the scales, we're still using width and height. But really, what this should be is inner width and inner height. The inner width is going to be for this section here. So it's going to be the overall width minus the left and right margins. So here we can say const inner width equals width minus margin dot left minus margin dot right. And then inner height will be this segment here. It's going to be height minus the top and bottom margins. So what I'm going to do is copy paste inner width, change it to inner height, and this is going to be height minus margin dot top minus margin dot bottom. All right, now our bars are not going off the screen here, and we can sort of tweak the margin as we see fit. I'll set it back to 20. All right, we've done it. We've added margins. Now that we've got the space, we can go ahead and add the axes to our bar chart. After we define the x scale, we can define the x axis by saying const x axis equals, this is going to be on the left. So it's going to be an instance of axis left. And we need to import axis left from D3 as well. Once this line gets past 80 characters, I like to sort of make it more vertical so it's easier to read. When we invoke axis left here, we can pass in the x scale so that the axis knows what scale it should use. You know, it's going to be on the left. I'm actually thinking of the y axis going up and down. It's going to be on the left. So I made a mistake here. This should be y and y. Yeah, so we can move this code down to here after y scale is defined. The way that we can use this is we can say g.append g to append a new group element. And in this group element, we're going to uh, put the y-axis. And the way that we can do this is we can just invoke y-axis and pass in this new group element. See, now we've got our axis over here. It's working. Let me tweak the left margin a little bit to make sure that we can see these labels. I'll make it say 100. All right, we can sort of see these labels here. Calling a function like this and passing in a selection is quite common in D3, so much so that there's actually a shorthand for this where on a selection you can say dot call. And then what you pass into call is a function that will be invoked with this selection. And because we're just using y-axis here, we may as well just define the axis right there inside of that call right there. Now let's add the x-axis. We can follow a similar pattern. In fact, I'm just going to copy paste that. But this time, it's going to be on the bottom. So we can say axis bottom. And we want to pass in the x scale. And axis bottom, I don't believe we imported that. So we can import that here as well. And what happened here is we are actually getting some text. 
see if I um, comment out, if I delete these rectangles, you can see that it's there, but it's on the top, not the bottom. We can move this down to the bottom, this whole axis, by translating it, or rather translating its group element. So I'm going to put these rectangles back, and after we append this group element and call our axis, I'm going to say, okay, what we want to do is very similar to this translate here. So I'm going to copy paste that and translate it. Well, we don't want to translate it to the right at all, so I'll put zero there. And we want to translate it down based on inner height to put it at the bottom. All right, there it is. It's at the bottom now. I'll just tweak the right margin a little bit so we can see that complete number. I think I'll make it maybe 40. I kind of want a little bit of separation between the bars. To do that, on the Y scale, we can set the padding by saying dot padding is, let's say, 0 0.2, or how about 0 0.1. That gives us a nice little bit of separation here. And we can tweak a few styles in the CSS just to make it a little more palatable. On the rect elements, we can set the fill to be steel blue. Just paying homage, I want to pay homage to the early D3 examples by Mike Bostock that all used steel blue, and it's become sort of an iconic color with D3. I also want to make those text labels a little bit bigger, so we can select all text elements. And this is fine for now, because the only text elements are these ticks, but in the future we can make this selector more specific to avoid you know, styling text that we don't want to. But for now we can say, all right, for all text elements, let's make the font size a little bit bigger, like 1.4 em, say. All right, now we can sort of read these text labels. All right, that's all for making a bar chart. But I would like to give you an exercise to do. I'd like you to fork this visualization by clicking on fork right here and just change the data to some other data with maybe less than 10 entries. And it could be on any topic that you choose. But yeah, pick a topic that you care about that's interesting to you. So yeah, just change the data in this visualization. Give the bars new meaning. But also be sure to cite the source of your data. And actually, I forgot to do that. Let me just do that real quick. All right, here's the page for the data set, and it's called World Population Prospects 2017. So over in this readme.md file, I want to type some text and say, this bar chart shows population of the top 10 most populous countries. The data comes from the year 2018 estimate in World Population Prospects 2017. And this is markdown syntax for adding a link. And in this, these parentheses here, I'm going to copy this URL and paste it right there like that. So now the description shows up, and this is a link. And linking to the source of the data is super important. And I, sh I think I should also say this is from the United Nations. All right, that's how you can cite the source. All right, that's really it for making a bar chart with D3 and SVG. Thanks for watching. Take care.